This podcast is a forum for soldiers, leaders, and experts from across our nation to share personal and professional lessons of leadership and to highlight outstanding members of the Lancer Brigade team. Welcome to the Lancer Leadership Experience. All right, team, welcome to the Lancer Leadership Experience. Um, I'm Major Naylor. I'm hosting today in uh, Colonel Rohrman's stead, and I'm very excited to be able to introduce you, Monster Mike Schultz. Um, he has an awesome story that uh, he's going to share bits and pieces of with us today. But for starters, he's a two-time Paralympian, a snowboarder. He's won a gold and two silver medals, um, 10 times X Games champion, uh, multiple World Cup uh, gold medals as well. Um, great, great background in a lot of things applicable to us in our, our military pursuits. And so we're very excited to, uh, to introduce Mike to the uh, team. So Mike, thanks for being here. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks, Major Naylor. As I know you as Jake, uh, yeah, uh, probably come up in our conversation, but we've spent a fair bit of time uh, together around the world in a few different places. But yeah, thanks for having me on the show and uh, excited to talk about all kinds of fun stuff. Yeah, and uh, just for just for our team here, so I met Mike, actually was in the Netherlands at a World Cup uh, snowboarding event. It was my first time going out there with the team, and um, as a matter of fact, Mike was the first person I met when I showed up in the airport, saw him sitting there, and uh, we got to talking, and uh, uh, right off the bat, you know, just recognized um, him as a very cool person for a number of reasons. Um, he had some experience with the military in some different capacities, uh, uh, which he'll get to through his story. And um, I was just really impressed with him. And so down the road, I think when we were in Norway at a world championship later, uh, I had mentioned to him this, this idea of coming on here. So again, Mike, thanks for, thanks for making time to, to come out today. Yeah, absolutely. So, so the first thing I kind of wanted to give you a chance to share your story. Um, in, in, in the Army, we talk a lot about overcoming adversity, you know, whether it's in a specific military engagement or in, you know, an individual's career path or, uh, you know, whatever the, the space may be. You know, a lot of us experience ad adversity in some form or fashion. Um, and I, I think really your story uh, truly embodies how you were faced with an adversity as a professional athlete that you truly were able to overcome. And so I'll kind of leave it at that. Can you, can you kind of walk us through your story and um, kind of how you got to where you are? Yeah. Um, well, I, it, it all kind of got really exciting um, in like 2003 to 2008. Um, I was living my dream as a professional snowmobile racer, racing snowcross, which is like motocross on snow on snowmobiles. And, you know, I was one of the, one of the top guys for a few years, banging bars with the best of the best. And um, yeah, definitely a roller coaster of emotions and physical side of it as well. You know, chasing the tour, getting banged up and charging back through injuries and, and uh, landed myself on the podium a handful of times. And um, yeah, it, it was going really good. I, I uh, had a bit of a rough patch in, in uh, the 2007, 2008 season as far as results. So I, I, uh, I knew I wanted to kind of change my environment and ended up signing with the new race team going into the 08, 09 season. And, you know, I had a new fire. I was working with a, a new um, personal trainer. I was getting my fitness in, you know, higher than it ever was which is major key, uh, when you're racing a 500 pound, 150, 60, uh, horsepower snowmobile. So, sure. you know, I was, I was, I was ready to charge forward. And, um, the second round of that season up in Northern Michigan, uh, during a qualifying race, I was, uh, working my way through the pack after a, a really horrible start. And I just, I hit a hole funny, coming down this steep downhill section and uh, it pitched me off the side of the machine and uh, I landed feet first in the snow and on impact my left knee buckled 180 degrees in the wrong direction and um, I went tumbling to the side of the race course and immediately knew that you know I my my knee was was jacked up I uh, actually kicked myself in the chin with my toe uh, as I was tumbling and uh wow. Things got really serious when the EMTs got over to me and my leg was just kind of flopping around, um, just basically 
hanging on by a thread of skin. Um, and so the compound fracture caused the, or uh, severed the popliteal artery. And so I was bleeding out on the side of the racetrack and, and, um, yeah, I, I knew it was serious. They, uh, they bandaged me up real quick, put me in a toboggan and brought me to the first hospital. And my wife, Sarah was by my side through all of this and she's a nurse. So she did everything she could to kind of do what she could to help me stay calm. And the first hospital was not equipped to deal with my situation. And, um, they tried to get me life flighted to a trauma center, but the snowstorm moved in. We couldn't fly, had to, um, get back in the ambulance and drive two and a half hours to a trauma center in Duluth, Minnesota from wow. Ironwood, Michigan. And, um, I was a long, that was a long, uh, few hours, uh, to get to the trauma center. And, um, were you, point, uh, were you coherent conscious through all of this? <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, I uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it was it was rough, man. I yeah, I wish I could have passed out. The the pain was just relentless, and my blood pressure bottomed out, so I couldn't have any pain meds to help control oh, the man. pain. And so it was, uh, man, it was it was a tough spot. And over the course of the next three days, they did multiple surgeries, and um, it was on the the third day where the doctor comes in my whole family's in the room and you know, my, my leg is still there. It's, it's got external fixators holding it all together and it's all bandaged, bandaged up. And he, he says, we've got a tough decision to make here. And he explained to me that I had no nerve activity in my foot. So he was like probing my toes and the bottom of my foot. And like, I tried like hell to, to feel it, but I, I it was just numb. And, um, he explained that and my overall health was deteriorating really fast. My kidneys were shutting down basically because of the circulation problems, the tissue was dying in my lower foot and it was, it was poisoning from the inside. And, um, he's like, man, I don't know how many more surgeries you're going to make it through because you're, you're in a, in a rough spot here. And at this point we think it's the best course of action to amputate your leg just above the knee. And this, this was the first I've heard anything about amputation. And so it, it hit me like a ton of bricks and yeah. And to, to hear that initial thought is I'm not going to be able to do what I love to do anymore. And, you know, initially that was the hardest thing to process, but it was kind of an easy decision because I knew that was kind of the only way forward for me to survive through it. And, um, my wife and I, and the rest of my family, we all kind of, you know, nodded our head and, you know, let's, let's go through it and take it one step at a time and see what we can do with it. Was that something that you decided right then and there on the spot? Did you take a moment or hours to kind of converse about, or was this all just like right then and there? Uh, it was, it was probably over the course of a half hour to an hour of discussion and, um, <laughs> learning, after the fact that, so Sarah, my wife, she was, you know, talking with the doctors and so she knew it was coming. And, um, so everything was prepared. So within, I think it was like two hours, I went back into surgery and that's when they did the amputation. Wow. That's a, that's a big turn of events within about a 72 hour period to go from competing to, I do not have my leg anymore. Um, when you awoke from that surgery, I mean, can you, I, I know we'll never be able to fully understand, but can you kind of, um, relay how you felt, what you were thinking? I mean, what was the, the nature of, of your, you know, mood and emotion upon waking? Yeah, it, uh, so the moment I woke up, I was just overcome with the most extreme pain I've ever dealt with it. Uh, it was nerve pain phantom pain. And, um, yeah, it was, it was a long 12, 18 hours following that they, they threw every medication they could at me to try and calm it down. And it just, it, it wouldn't work. And, um, you know, other than that, like the biggest thing I, I could feel was like not having a leg attached to my body, like I'm moving my limb around. So they, they, uh, removed it about three inches above the end of the femur. 
and just that feeling of like nothing there. It was, it was surreal. Um, Mm. so yeah, it was, it was a tough few days after that, you know, trying to manage the pain and I had to go back into surgery and, and they, um, uh, or no, I, it's all kind of blending together right now, but they did a whole bunch of stuff to try and sort it out. And, uh, yeah, I had to grit my teeth and the, they, they gave, they gave me some, uh, ketamine and uh-huh. that, that like blew my mind away. Like I was having hallucinations and like, I thought I was in a dungeon getting all kinds of tests done on me by mad scientists. And yeah, I, I, it, it's it's so funny because well it's funny looking back at it now so like i i wear contacts and they took them out before surgery and and we all forgot about it afterwards and so my mind is like filling in the pieces of the things that i can't see uh, along with the hallucinations and like the, everybody looked like they had big white beards on them because everybody was a little blurry and oh man it was it was a trip I, uh, I said, I'd rather deal with the pain than deal with this hallucinations. man. I thought they were doing crazy things to me. It was, it was wild. It's I'm glad you can laugh about it now, but I'm sure in the moment that was pretty, uh, pretty traumatic for you. Um, yeah. so I mean, your hospital stay was probably pretty extended after that. I would imagine. I spent uh, a total of, uh, 13 days from okay. the time I got there to the time I, I left. And, um, you know, one of the things that saved me and, and excelled everything was the physical condition I was in previous to the injury. Like I was, um, I was able to bounce back pretty quick. I dealt with the, the phantom pain for, uh, it was about five weeks, um, to where it was, man, I tried everything. I tried acupuncture, mirror therapy, different medications. And, um, uh, it didn't really fade away until I started walking in my prosthesis, which was about five and a half weeks later. And, um, so then that, you know, it kind of took my mind off of the pain and now, you know, not, not just sitting there thinking about the pain. So as soon as I was able to distract my mind, it was able to kind of fade away a little bit. So when you went home 13 days later, between then and your first uh, prosthetic fitting, what was your mindset? Had you had even start, had you even started to think about a return to sport or were you just like, Hey, I want to get upright again. Or were there just so many unknowns that you weren't even thinking about that? It was, you know, the, the toughest part was like, I knew I wouldn't be a competitor anymore. Right. I didn't believe so at that time, a competitor in the things that I, I was doing, you know, like the snowmobiles and the dirt bikes, because motocross is, is my true passion. Like I absolutely love that. And I figured I'd had have to get rid of my dirt bike. Um, but then it was, uh, I don't know. It was about 10 days after I got home, I suppose. Um, I was feeling better. I was up, you know, roaming around on crutches and, you know, I'm like, I got to get out of the house. I just, you know, and it's, let's see, this was uh, January in Minnesota, which is crazy cold and snow banks everywhere, ice right. everywhere. And, uh, like, I'm going to be productive today. I, I'm going to go get the mail. And I had, you know, I got a long driveway. I wasn't going to crutch it. So I went in my garage and uh i got on my snowmobile i got little dollies underneath it so i can like roll it around on the concrete and so i pointed it outside and fired it up and i went to to go out of the driveway and there's a snowbank there a real steep one i'm like oh, i can't get it turned this way so i'm gonna have to just go over this big snowbank well i make it about six feet and the skis start going up the snowbank and the track is on glare ice so I like get stuck and I'm like, Oh shit, what am I going to do now? But I was, I was like enjoying the moment because I was outside. I had fresh air and uh, you know, I finally got it wiggled loose and I was ripping around up and down the, the road ditch for, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. And this is all while Sarah just went back to work. So and, she didn't uh, even know. <laughs> she didn't know. And she, she probably wouldn't have been happy that either. afternoon and sees the tracks all over. And she's like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> And I'm just smiling from ear to ear. And, and, you know, at that moment, I'm like, you know what? I'm probably not going to be racing again, but, you know, I'm still going to be able to, to get behind a set of handlebars and have some fun. That's cool. That's a, I didn't know. I hadn't heard that. That's a, that's an awesome story that quick after and to find some joy within the recovery, which is obviously a, you know, a process that for, for everyone at some point is going to be depressing, is going to be, 
you know, very negative or, you know, maybe even bring, bring out the reality that there's some things you want to do, you might not be able to, but that's pretty cool that you were able to find some, a glimmer, a glimmer of light at, at that point. So that's, that's a really cool story. Yeah. So let's fast forward to kind of this, the story that, you know, makes you famous in the sense for what you were able to kind of come up with on your own. So you, you get your prosthetic, you, you start walking around and, you know, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you kind of figured out that the prosthetics you were offered wouldn't allow you to even come close to doing the things that you were um, interested in doing. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I got my first walking leg, um, it was, yeah, five and a half weeks out and it was a very basic mechanical system. So um, I knew I was going to get upgraded, but because of insurance timing and all that, you know, complicated business, um, my prosthetist wanted me to get up on something as soon as possible. So we just got a, a simple piece that was, uh, you know, I crashed on a lot and, uh, you know, it, it forced me to learn the mechanics of walking. So I got on my snowmobile and I'm riding around on it, you know, within 30 seconds. I'm like, yeah, this ain't going to cut it. So I did some research and, um, you know, I found like one or two options built for sport and neither one of them had the range of motion or the, the, uh, the mechanics of movement that I needed to get back riding again. And so my true second passion in life is, is, uh, I'm a shop guy. I love building and designing things in my metal shop. And, you know, through my years of racing snowmobiles and dirt bikes, I really understand suspension components and so basically i i'm like i just need a suspension component for my leg you know like what your quadriceps do to help you stand up and absorb those big bumps and jumps and and i had a whole lot of time on my hands so um you know this is i'm like i i'm pretty sure i could develop something uh that would allow me to ride again and what really motivated me to, to take it to the, the next step was finding out about the um, Summer X Games Adaptive Supercross, which is a supercross race just for amputees and paraplegics. And it's at Summer X in LA. And so I'd raced Winter X Games uh, on my snowmobile for, I think it was eight years before that. And so that the X Games are a huge part of my professional career. And I'd never been to the level to compete at the summer games in motocross. I just didn't have the talent for it. So this was a, an awesome opportunity to be at the summer games. And so as soon as I heard about it, I'm like this, yep, I'm in, this is, this is my new life goal and I need to create the tools to let me do. And so, you know, I hit the shop and spent about, uh, five weeks designing, um, uh, the geometry with, based around a Fox mountain bike shock and, you know, getting the, the range of motion all, all set to what I needed to stand up and sit down on the bike. And, um, yeah, I went into the shop and about a week later had my first working prototype and, and it, the first time I bolted it on, like I, uh, you know, kind of squat up and down on it. I'm like, Oh yeah, I, I, I can work with this. This is, you know, it's helping me stand back up and I can jump up and down on it. It just, it's a shock absorber. And so I, I hopped over to my motocross bike and I went for a cruise down the ditch, down this really rough whooped out uh, section of trail. And I was able to stand up and just twist grip and just fly. It was, uh, it was so fun. I, yeah, I was just grinning and giggling like a little kid. <laughs> wow. Like, yes, I'm going to X Games. This is going to be awesome. That is super cool. Were you, I, I was always curious to ask you, did you ever take these prosthetics like up, up front when you were kind of exploring this and designing yourself to your prosthetist and say like, hey, this is what I'm making, you know? What do you think of this? Or can you do better? Or what, what was the relationship like at that point? Um, uh, I was, I was fortunate. I got teamed up with a great prosthetist who had an open mind. Um, he's an outdoorsman. He loves the snowmobile. Um, and so I, he helped me try and find something. Uh, but when we couldn't find something, I, I told him like, yeah, well, I think I'm going to go develop something. And he was probably a little, uh, you know, yeah, I'm sure he'll come up with something, but it's not going to work or, but yeah. you know, he, he believed in me right from the start, honestly. Um, you know, he's a mechanical thinker and he knew, I knew what I was talking about and had some great experience creating things. So, um, 
the first one, the first prototype, it was, it wasn't pretty, you know, it was just a proof of concept. So it was real blocky and heavy and, um, but you know, the mechanics of it worked great. And, um, so then over the next couple months, then I, I developed the, a more, um, robust and slim, uh, trim, trim or lighter weight one. Um, and that's what I went to X games with, which was seven months after my amputation happened. Wow. Um, yeah, it was, there was so much that happened and you know, that's, that's part of how I coped with, with the situation I was in is I just found something I love to do and just focused on it. And, you know, so many times where, you know, people are in a tough spot, they, they kind of just stop they stop doing what they're doing and they just sit and think about what I can't do. I can't do this or, you know, this has changed me or, or that kind of way. But like, if you can keep your mind and body busy in a productive, positive direction, I mean, to me, that's, that's the biggest thing you can do to help move forward. No, that's a great point. Um, I think about that a lot as a physical therapist because people will come in and it's usually an isolated injury, right? They'll come in and they sprain their ankle, they hurt their knee, whatever. And, you know, we tend naturally to focus on that uh, and think that that is stopping us from doing everything without acknowledging, hey, I still have, you know, three fourths of my body functioning fine. I can still get in the gym and I can... I can still work out, you know, train my upper body, use my other leg. I can do a lot of things. Um, and I think in that vein, um, like you describe, if, if you focus on what you can do, even in the presence of injury, usually you can lead to a better outcome because mentally you're more positive, you're focused, you're working harder. And then also if you're healthier generally by continuing to train around an injury, usually the injury you're dealing with tends to get better faster. So I think that's a very applicable point. Um, for us all. So when, when, at what point then does this go from, Hey, I'm helping myself do what I want to maybe I can start to help others. Um, you know, when did you kind of make that switch that you actually had a good idea that would, that would be helpful to other, um, amputees. So over the course of that summer in 2009, um, going to the adaptive motocross races, I met a handful of amputees and, you know, they're all using their regular equipment. So it was like, that midsummer to, to fall, I, uh, you know, I learned a lot more about prosthetics and what was and wasn't available. And I'm like, this, this component works really good. And there's definitely others that could utilize it. So like that summer, I, I tested it for a whole, a whole bunch of different sports, like, uh, mountain biking, road biking, um, wakeboarding and, um, yeah, what else was there horseback riding and realize that if I just made a couple modifications to it, to allow a, a, a wider range of, of calibration and alignment options for all of these sports, like it could be a really versatile tool. And, um, so I'm like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to start a company. I believed in the product and I knew I could come up with some more components over time. And, um, so I officially started BioAdapt in July, 2010. And my first, uh, component was available, um, about, you know, it was about nine months later, uh, early 2011. And it was, uh, I tell you what, the first time that I had somebody try it out, I I'm, I'm trying to remember that. I think it was Jim Wozni. Um, we meet up on snowmobiles. Uh, we were getting ready for winter X games snowmobile races and uh, they added the adaptive class that year and we were training here in minnesota and, and he came up and he'd been using his everyday hydraulic knee system and he was he was hesitant to try it because he's he did, he's been an amputee for um uh it was several years before before me and so he had a lot of this stuff figured out and um he's like well i i suppose i'll just try it so he went around the snow cross track, like three, you know, two, three laps. And he comes in, he's like, ah, this thing is bucking me all over. It's standing me up and, you know, it's kicking me off to the left or off to the right. And I'm like, just, just stick with it. Just, you know, spend 10, 15 minutes on it. So you understand how, how to, how to work it and move around on it. And, uh, I could see clear as day that his riding changed, uh, for the better. 
enormously. He's able to stand up through the rough sections and um, he comes back in and he's like, yeah, I don't know. It's still kind of kicking me all over. And I didn't really say anything. I'm like, well, okay, put yours back on. And he made it about three quarters of a lap and he just pulls off the track and he comes back over to me like, this thing sucks. <laughs> so he's like, I want yours back. And uh, so that was a really cool moment in time that, you know, I realized what I had been developing was definitely going to help others, um, you know, increase their performance. And um, then fast forwarding a little bit, uh, the first veteran that I got to work with, his name is Keith um, uh, Army. And um, he was injured in 2002, I think. And he'd been snowboarding on a different component for many years before I met him. And he saw my, my moto knee at X Games while I was racing snowcross. And he's like, hey, does that work for snowboarding? And uh, I'm like, I, I think so. You know, I haven't, I, I don't snowboard. I wakeboard in the summertime a little bit. So I understand, you know, the basics of riding sideways and, uh, was like, I'll, I'll get back to you. I'm going to go home and test, do some testing. And I learned how to snowboard over the next couple of weeks and ended up meeting him out in Colorado. And he, he put it on and it just blew my mind what he was able to do on it within the first half of a run. And, um, yeah, I was, that was a really special moment. It, uh, it opened the door up for me working with Walter Reed, which, uh, you know, initially for those first few years, um, they, you know, they allowed me to, uh, create a lot of equipment and, uh, you know, help out a lot of our vets. So, um, that was a very rewarding area to be working in. Wow. That's awesome. You know, you, you were able to kind of help, uh, that initial veteran with, uh, with his snowboarding, was it then that you decided to kind of tinker with it yourself or what led you to pursue that as a sport? Uh, yeah. So that evolved into the following year. Um, so within that, that first year, it was uh, 2011 to 2012. Um, I had sent a lot of equipment to Walter Reed and um, I got to know Harvey Naranjo who runs the, um, I don't know what his title is exactly, but he, he does a lot of the therapy, physical therapy and activities, um, uh, for recovering, um, vets. And so they go out to Colorado every year and do a couple snowboard and ski trips. And so he invited me to come out and help out just to, you know, kind of be the, the equipment, um, uh, mechanic, so to speak. Sure. And so I'm like, heck yeah, I'm, 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 I'm game. And so we did a few of those trips and I, I really learned how, how to snowboard and I absolutely loved it. And while I was doing that, um, the, um, adaptive sports program that I had got to know called adaptive action sports, they, uh, they were helping out with the X games, adaptive supercross. And so like, Hey, you should try racing snowboards. Like we got a good group of guys and, uh, we got a world cup tour and they, at that point they were working to get snowboarding into the Paralympics, uh, going into Sochi. And I'm like, well, I'll give it a try. And so I ended up racing a couple of times and, you know, it's, it's a lot like motocross, except you're going downhill sideways with no handlebars. And so I, I enjoyed it a lot. I tackled hard. Oh my gosh. I, I hit the ground so hard and it was scary it was so scary like i fly my snowmobile and dirt bike 100 plus feet through the air but send me downhill on a snowboard those first few years it was i was just trying to hang on and make it um but uh yeah so it became you know one of one of my sports and i'm from central minnesota flatland usa so there's not a lot of great riding here so that's why i never really got into it but now with all these trips going out to Colorado and, you know, the most epic, uh, snowboard areas in the world, it, um, I'm like, this is, this is cool. And so after Sochi, um, in 2014, the Sochi games, there was two amputees that were using my equipment at that time. So I was, I was following it and never did I want to pursue that at that point. Cause it was, there was only one class, uh, or one for men and one for women. And, and me being an above knee amputee, um, I'd be racing against like single below knee amputees, which can perform so much better than I can. And so like, I would never be competitive. So until they added classifications, I had really no interest in it. 
And then, um, yeah, in, in late summer, uh, 2014, they added classes, which put me into my own category. And, and, um, so I got the, the phone call from the coach at that time, the U S Paralympic coach for snowboarding. He's like, what do you think, Schultze? You got, you know, if, if, uh, if you pursue it and put some effort into it, we think you could be a, a real contender. And it was, it was hard for me because at that point I was, you know, I was doing um, some really big things in adaptive motocross and snowmobiles and at the X games. So I was like fully committed to motorsports yet and making some money with sponsors. And, you know, it was, it was a fun ride and this would change everything. Cause you know, if I wanted to pursue that, that would have to be the priority. Um, but then I, you know, Sarah and I started to think about it and I'm like, what if, what if I could make the Paralympic team and compete with the red, white, and blue jersey on and, you know, find myself on that podium? You know, I, I watched the Olympics all the time growing up and, you know, seeing the emotions go through those athletes when they're on top of the podium in front of the world, listening to their national anthem, that would be cool. And it was an opportunity that, I didn't want to pass up, nor did Sarah. She's like, let's, let's do it. So from then forward, snowboarding became one of my biggest priorities in sports and it went really good. <laughs> it went, yeah, it sure went did. Really good. Can you, yeah. Talk to us about 2018. I mean, so many cool opportunities. Um, yeah. Just kind of tell me your story. I'm sure I'll have some questions. Yeah. At, um, so at that point, you know, um, going into 2014, 15 season, you know, BioAdapt had grown a lot and there is, you know, we had a couple hundred components out, uh, to athletes and vets and, um, you know, weekend warriors to top elite athletes. And, um, so it was really cool getting on the world cup tour and there's so many other athletes wearing equipment I built. And, um, so that was a really cool part of it. And then going into the 2018 games, I had, I had some setbacks over those couple of years with injuries and, um, but I kept charging forward and earned my spot to the games in 2018. And the coolest part, um, one of the coolest parts was, uh, when the U S Paralympic team voted me to carry our flag in opening ceremony. Uh, which was, it was an incredibly proud thing that I was able to do. Um, and it meant so much, um, you know, leading up to that, oh, you know, a few of the years before that I had the opportunity to, to uh, travel around the world and visit our troops in the middle East and also at some bases here, uh, stateside. And so I, I was able to spend a lot of time with our, our veterans and military and, and, uh, you know, carrying that flag, that's, that's what that meant to me was, you know, representing our, our, uh, you know, our men and women in uniform and, you know, I'm got to carry the red, white, and blue, you know, not only for my sport, but for all of us. And so that was a really, a really emotional, proud thing that I was able to do. And, um, and that season I was uh, a favorite to, to win in my class. I had been really dominant that year. I went undefeated in the world cup series, uh, in border cross. And so at this time it was just head to head racing. Uh, right now in Beijing, it was four wide back then it was two wide. So I went through a whole bracket making my way up, you know, having to race against my teammates, which was kind of, you know, not ideal, like, <laughs> cause you, it's a bracket. So you win, you move on and you lose and, and you're out. And right. so I knocked out a couple of my teammates um, through the brackets and then got into that gold medal round, the final, and was able to just, uh, you know, get a great start and hit my marks all the way down and, and cross the line, winning gold in border cross, which, uh, you know, crossing that line was such an emotional <laughs> explosion. Um, and it, you know, it wasn't all that much about snowboarding. It was everything that led up to that moment that allowed me to be there. And then, you know, be the fastest in the world in, in my class at that time. It was just, it was such an incredible feeling. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it, I can uh, only imagine. I mean, that's like you say, adding in the kind of the, you know, representing your country component, um, which, 
you know, X Games are great. You know, there's the opportunity for sponsorship money, competition, you know, everything an athlete wants. But then to take it to the next level, like on the Paralympic stage where, you know, you've got countries from around the world and, and you're representing something bigger than yourself. I, I can only imagine how how cool that is. And, you know, I was going to ask you because I noticed I think I asked you about this in uh, the Netherlands, but you, you always sew an American flag on your uh your uniform somewhere. I, I thought that was really cool. Can you describe what started that or how you, how you started to do that? Yeah. I, um, so even back in my pro snowcross days, uh, I always had a flag somewhere, um, you know, whether it be on my machine or on my helmet, I had a couple red, white, and blue custom painted helmets. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a Patriot. I love our country and what it all stands for. So like, I want to showcase that whenever I can. Um, so yeah, when I got into the snowboarding, I, I loved the, the, the team gear. We always have a flag somewhere, or we did for a long time. And, and then I ended up putting a flag on every one of my snowboards, as well as on my left leg, my left pant leg. And, um, so that's like the first thing I do when I get a new, a new pair of pants that I'm going to compete in is, is put the flag on there. Cause it, it, uh, you know, it means a lot to me. That's very cool. I, I know when. When I watch something like that, I, I obviously appreciate that. And I think, I think a lot of people do. So, um, man, I mean, your story is just amazing for so many reasons. And we haven't even gotten to, you know, <laughs> the Beijing yet. But um, when, when, you, when you think about snowboarding, um, you know, and I've kind of seen some of this firsthand, but people don't realize it's quite a grind, like a World Cup or World Championship where – you know, you've got two different events and you have multiple heats and races in each event. And, and it's a grind, both physically and mentally. I wanted to ask if you could talk about, you know, what you do um, kind of from a mental resiliency standpoint. Like, you know, if you have a bad heat, how do you bounce back? If you're if you have a setback within a race, you know, how do you bounce back? And, and how do you kind of have that, um, you know, re-engage that effort every time as if it's like your first race or whatever what's your mental process as you compete yeah that's uh, evolved and got better over time i mean that's something that that resiliency um you know that mental resiliency is is something that you learn over time with with ups and downs of competition and you know earlier on in my career when i'd have a bad day uh, a bad result, you know, it would grind on me for a long time. And, and, um, you know, as I get a little older in my competitive years, like I have, I have a, a system like, like on competition day. Um, I, I try and start the morning the same way, same diet, um, you know, leading or going to bed the night before I do a, a series of visualizations. And so I'm, I'm like mentally prepared of, to what I'm going to do the next day. Um, and nothing is, is more important than having that, that concrete mindset going into a big competition, like the Paralympic games, like, um, this year I, I, we had so many distractions, uh, with COVID protocol and, you know, the competition was extremely fierce and close. And like, there's so many things that you could latch on to that would put you in a negative spot like oh i had a bad qualifying run or um you know this covid protocol is such a big thing like our, for the last two years everything that we did with traveling and racing and you had to worry about the whole covid problem which affected our travel it affected our training our competition and um so it's just like compartmentalizing each component of what your day is and just think about it separately. Um, so you can focus on the things that you need to and the things you don't, you just kind of like box it up and you just put it, put it away. You put it yeah. aside and don't think about it until you have to, um, you know, that that's one of the things. And then just like the confidence, you know, I, I, me myself, I I'm not always super confident unless I make myself be, you know, I re reiterate to myself, like you have beat all these guys, your lap times are better. Um, you know, I may have made a mistake here or there, but I am capable of being the fastest guy out here. And that's something that I keep kind of 
telling myself and, and telling myself that I am more prepared than the rest of these guys. Um, I work harder, you know, every part of my training game is better than theirs. You know, whether it is or not, like I'm, I'm telling myself it is because I know the time and, and work that I put in to be where I'm at as an athlete. So I see you in the gym every, every day when you're on, when you're on a trip, you're always working out, you're always training. I, I think, yeah, I mean, you do so many things that, that definitely are noticed. That's, that's something that, you know, I, I wish, I wish I could go back to my pro snowcross days and take what I've learned over these last eight years and apply it. Because I would, you know, I would be in a lot better mental place and more resilient and more focused um, if I could do that over again. My uh, my kids picked up on that you always slap your helmet right before you drop. <laughs> What's that all about? That's my pre race routine. It, it uh, yeah. So my my pre race routine right before I drop in the gate is so I squat up and down like six to eight times to get my hydraulic oil warmed up so it's consistent. <laughs> um, and then I visualize the first, like the first section through the first corner and know exactly where I'm going to be. And then I slap my help, my slap my head three times, which, which kind of brings that mental focus, um, the mental and physical, you know, that the impact of my hand hitting my head, it just kind of, you know, it just kind of pulls focus. So you're in the moment. Um, at least that's what I think it does. So. <laughs> hey, it, it must be do, it must be working for you. You know, you've you've uh, proved time and time again that you uh, you're the best of the best. So, um, so let's fast forward to this year, Beijing. After all the drama from the pandemic, and you know, seeing some of the testing protocols firsthand, I, I just felt bad for you guys. It was just it was painful, you know. And um, uh, anyway, so you get over there and. Um, you know, I, I don't think you had the, the finish that you wanted necessarily. Talk to us about that. Um, and then talk to us about, you know, what you were proud of in this year's uh, Beijing Games. Yeah, going into Beijing was uh, the biggest difference between this year and last year um, as far as competition-wise is everybody elevated their game big time. Um, like there was, there was a bit of a gap between – you know, us top three last, the last games. And this year there was five riders that at any time, you know, are within a few tenths of a second of each other. Um, so I knew it was like, man, I have to be on my game, like perfect, you know, to make this happen. And, um, yeah, going, going into the border cross, uh, the Canadian Ty Turner, um, he was, he's a big dude, like, weight wise. And so he goes downhill really fast, which, you know, is, is a benefit and he can snowboard really well. He's a bilateral BK. So I, I knew that, you know, I'd have to have some luck in order for me to, to, you know, keep up with him. Um, but you know, throughout the day of qualifying, I won my semifinal, got into the, the gold medal round and, um, I kind of got a bad start. And I, and I was, uh, in fourth place going into turn two and I'm like, oh shit, I don't have much time to make something happen here. And so, um, I dove inside and in turn two and was able to kind of push the guys a little wide and came out of turn two in second place and was able to charge forward from there. And so I came down, I think I was about a second and a half behind Ty, um, and brought home a silver, which honestly, like. I was pumped because the first thing that I think about is not my result. It's, it's the way I rode. Um, mm. you know, did I make any mistakes? Did I ride to my full potential? And if, if I did that, then, you know, I'm like, if I got beat, I got beat. Um, and so that was the case. Uh, the silver medal felt amazing though. It was like, cause my goal was to, to podium in both classes or both races. Um, oh geez. Are you able to hear that? <laughs> No, no, I didn't hear anything. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, I, um, uh, where was I? Uh, yeah, the silver medal, it was, it was awesome. Cause it, it, um, you know, I knew how hard I worked for it and I, you know, I just, I didn't have the speed to win. So, you know, I was happy with my performance. I was happy being on the podium. My goal was to podium in both classes. Um, obviously wanted to win. I knew I could win and, you know, in, in most cases, but um, just didn't have it this time, but the, the cool thing was, is every rider in the gold medal round and the small final were all wearing equipment I built in my shop. 
And uh, so I helped them all get a little bit faster. And uh, so sometimes you know, at your like, own expense. <laughs> I know, I know. I, it, uh, yeah, Ty Turner, he's got two of my Versa feet on. So, you know, he it definitely elevated his performance and, uh, you know, at least a little bit. So, um, and then in uh, Bank Slalom, uh, which is race against the clock one at a time through a series of uh, bank turns, which is super fun. It's all about finding your flow. Um, and I, I rode the best I've ever ridden, but I just, I, yeah, I didn't, I didn't have the right race line or, you know, I was off in one or two corners, you know, I could have been a little tighter and I ended up fifth, which is the worst I've ever placed uh, all year, but I was five hundredths of a second off of third place. So um, close. second place was within a half a second and first place he was, he was a ways out there, but um, no, I like, I couldn't be upset because it's like my second run, I went over a half a second faster than my first run. So it was like, I improved. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't enough. So it was, it, it was, it was a bit of a gut punch to look up at the scoreboard and see myself in fourth. And then uh, Noah Elliott, my teammate, came by um, right behind me, and he beat me by two hundredths of a second. I'm like, you got to be kidding me! <laughs> oh man! But there again, you know, it, it the bigger picture was all the athletes that I got to work with and help out along the way, and um, yeah, at, at my expense a little bit, <laughs> you know. Yeah. When, we're, when well, we're cutting it by hundredths of a second, it's uh, you know, <laughs> the equipment's going to help out that much. So but for I take sure. pride in helping those guys. They're, they're awesome to work with. No. And, uh, it was, it was super fun for us to watch from back here. And, um, I, I was always impressed. I saw a number of different interviews you did during the time and, and you really spoke to that bigger picture. And I, you probably know the numbers, but I want to say there were like 20 some odd athletes at these games using your equipment. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, 26 athletes from 11 countries. That's amazing. Um, yeah, it's uh yeah, that feels pretty rad. Yeah. We uh in the army we talk about like being a steward of the profession and um, you know, shepherding those younger than you as they come up through the ranks, being a good leader, um, taking care of what you're accountable for, leaving it better than you found it, that sort of thing. And you know, when I think of you and kind of what you've done for adaptive sports with your your company, it, that's exactly what I think of is you're, you're truly stewarding the profession going forward. And, and so I, I enjoyed watching you kind of reflect on that, even though you didn't get the outcome you wanted, you kept going back to that bigger picture of um, what you were able to do to help these other athletes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Making these kids, helping these kids out. <laughs> you know, I'm, a, I'm no kid anymore. I, you know, I, um, I'm 40 years old. And so that, you know, it's uh I've learned a lot over the years and, and, you know, I, I don't want to leave with all that knowledge in me. You know, I, I want to share it with, with my teammates and other competitors. And, you know, if that uh, helps them go faster, which inevitably allows them to beat me, well, that just means I got to step up my game more. And, uh, but so that, that, you know, I appreciate what I'm able to do as an athlete and as a business owner. And the older I get, the more I appreciate those experiences and how I can help others. And, um, you know, in the end, that's, that's, that's what I want my legacy to be is, is, uh, helping to progress adaptive sports and the athletes. That's awesome. When it comes to your career, what are you thinking at this point from an athletic perspective, you, you gunning for the next, uh, winter Paralympic games or what? Oh, I don't know. It's, um, you know, it's a 50, 50 shot right now. Um, you know, it's, it's a long ways out another four years. And, uh, I got some other things I want to try and accomplish too. And if I'm pursuing, you know, the games that's, uh, that's has to be priority. And, um, but you know, I love the process of being a professional athlete and traveling the world with my teammates and, you know, which, you know, sometimes kind of a, a love hate, you know, when you're, you, when you spend two, two, three, four weeks at a time on the road with, uh, you know, the same people, um, you know, you guys all know what it's about. It's like, sometimes they can drive you absolutely nuts, but you know, they're your best friends too. So, right. um, you know, it's <laughs> a good set of noise canceling headphones does wonders, <laughs> but, uh, I, I, you know, the games are in, in Italy, uh, in four years from now. And I absolutely loved being there when we did our world cup. So, you know, there is some motivation to continue. Um, 
but it's just too too early to to make that decision solid yet. Cool. Um, one other thing too, I kind of wanted to to ask you since we have a few more minutes. Um, I think you mentioned this during the the games this year, but you have some very specific kind of external motivation you find via your daughter. Can you talk to uh, talk to us a little bit, tell the team kind of how you use that relationship and some of, some of the fun things you've done with her to kind of motivate you as you're away. Uh, that was, that was, you know, my daughter, Lauren, she's eight years old and uh, she's a little gymnast. So she, she's really serious about it. And, you know, we don't have to push her at all. She just like, I want to do more. I want to, you know, I want to bump up to the next level. And she's just very motivated and hard charging. And, um, and it's a lot of fun because she's been my little gym partner. I've got my home gym here on my home property. So I spend a ton of time out here and she's out here with me uh, you know, a couple days a week when she's not at gymnastics and, you know, just being able to share the experience of being a professional athlete, um, you know, that's going to just help her perspective so much over time. And one of the fun things we have together is, uh, you know, when I'm traveling, she's not with me any of the time, really. Uh, we have our little, uh, dad daughter connection through our lucky bears. So she, uh, it started in 2018. She's got this little stuffed bear with, um, um, uh, lucky charms on it. And so she made me, or she put it in my backpack and I had no room for this little 12 inch tall stuffed bear. And she wouldn't take no for an answer. And since that day, that bear comes with me every competition trip that I go on. And now she's got her own little mini lucky bear. Um, so that's a lot of fun. And, um, you know, going back to the mental side of, of, uh, competition, one of the biggest things that helped me this time in Beijing was, uh, her and my wife, Sarah, they put together a whole bunch of envelopes full of photographs of us together riding horse or, you know, being together as a family camping and, and, uh, just these really cute pictures of all, all of us together. And so she's like, dad, you have to open one of these envelopes every morning. And she had special ones for race day. And that was the thing that made me smile every morning and remember what the big picture is all about. And, um, so I had my whole cabinet in my bedroom, um, in Beijing was just full of, of pictures of me and Lauren together, me, Lauren and Sarah. And it was the coolest thing that they could have done. And it, it just made me start the morning with a smile. It was awesome. That is, that's very cool. And I, I think that's, that's very applicable to a lot of us who have to spend time away from families. I don't think, uh, people necessarily think of athletes in those terms, but it's, it's a hard life for you guys. A lot of time on the road, um, a lot of distance. And, uh, so it was cool to kind of see how you, you make a way to prioritize your relationship with your family, even when you're, when you're away. Um, Mike, I could talk to you all day. I mean, I, I'm really <laughs> impressed with you. I, I think my boss, who I, I may have told you, but he, he's a pretty big-time snowboarder. He loves to snowboard, and uh, he was so excited to talk to you. I'm, I'm sure he's going to try to invite you to get you out here in person sometime and kind of mix and mingle with us. But um, we really appreciate your time. I think you're a great example of uh, someone who's overcome adversity, who's you know, on top of their game when it comes to mental resilience and, and physical, physical performance, obviously. Um, you've stewarded the profession of your sport so well. And, and you know, the, the lives of so many amputees and veterans have been blessed by you. And I, I think it's really commendable. And from everything I've seen, a great representative of our country. So really appreciate what you do. Um, I think you'll gain some more fans through this podcast from the Lancer Brigade. So, um, um, and I know a lot of what we've talked about is in, is in your book. Um, do you want to give us the name of that? Yeah. Yeah. That's a uh, 2022 was, uh, was a big year. I, um, you know, did the games and then, uh, launched my, my book called driven to ride, which, uh, yeah, I mean, that was a huge long undertaking and, uh, I couldn't be more excited with how it turned out. It, uh, you know, it covers a 10 year period of, just before my accident happened in 2008. And then the climax is at the end with uh, the performance in uh, Pyeongchang, South Korea at the Paralympic games and, and a whole lot of uh, exciting details, you know, between it all is some ups and downs with injuries and 
um, triumphs. And um, actually, uh, there's a, um, a whole chapter in there about my troop tours over to the Middle East. And um, so it's, uh, I've lived such a, an adventure in that 10 year period, I, you know, I, I didn't want to forget all those details. And that's really the motivation for me writing the book. And, you know, another motivation is, you know, hopefully it's able to help some others going through a tough time and you know, they can read through it. And, you know, hopefully there's some good examples in there that can, can help people out and keep them motivated and, um, you know, uh, dream big, work hard and enjoy the ride. That's awesome, Mike. Well, thanks again. Um, we'll, I'm sure we'll be in touch, and we really will try to coordinate getting you out here sometime to Washington State if you could come. I think a lot of people would uh, would benefit from from seeing what you do and, and learning more about you. So thanks again for your time. Um, we'll, uh, we'll look forward to our next podcast with Lancer Brigade and uh, sharing stories like this where, uh, you know, we can learn from those around us in a number of different interesti- industries to um, – glean some things that will benefit ourselves. So thanks again, Monster Mike Schultz.